Thank you, Sebastian, for the uh, kind introduction. So I'm happy here to present for you the uh, developments of Working Group 2. Uh, I'll do this together with uh, Michael, who will join me on the presentation. And the presentation was also prepared in close collaboration with Marius Chrysantopoulos from the University of Surrey, who could unfortunately not be here, but sends his regards to, to all of you. So as the title of the working group says, what we are looking at here in working group two is the link between structural health monitoring technologies and structural performance. What I'll do is briefly recapitulate the aims of this working group as they were set forward in the Memorandum of Understanding. I'll summarize the achievements, some activities for dissemination. The two main outcomes of this working group are the framework that we have delivered and then more recent work on the treatment of uncertainties. So we'll give that some more attention in this presentation. And then at the end, we'll wrap up with some conclusions. So we had two aims. Uh, so when this uh, proposal was written and looking at the uh, large amount of variability of structural health monitoring technologies, there was a clear need identified to somehow structure those and, and categorize those. So categorizing SHM technologies, so looking at what type of observations, what type of observ information they provide, and then relate this to structural performance and somehow identifying their best practices was the, the first aim for this working group. And then the second aim, when we are discussing information provided by observations, information provided by structural health monitoring, you can only quantify the information content when you identify and treat all uncertainties in a consistent way. So quantifying the links between measured quantities and structural performance and treating consistently all uncertainties therein was a second aim of the working group. Now at the start of this cost section, we were uh, very happy to attract the attention from uh, a large number of people, many uh, of you who are now in the room have, have contributed to uh, working group two. And we've had input from people working on different structural types, not only bridges, but also on antenna towers, historical masonry structures, different SHM technologies, um, probably interpreted in a wide sense as also including corrosion sensors, apart from accelerometers, fiber optics, so many possible technologies. Data analytics, so how can we translate those observations into information or at least take a first step in that process and then uh, a number of other things. So this was the basically established or identified in the first phase of the cost section. So we've had significant activities in the first four workshops and we've had more than 20 presentations and fact sheets that record current practice uh, dealing with all this. So Having this wide range of, of input dealing with different structural types and technologies um, helped us to set up a categorization framework to structure all these contributions. Uh, the aim was to have something that promotes the use of a, a common language terminology, so what is performance, what are performance indicators, observations, technologies, and so on, um, as was very well explained in the first presentation. The aim at the end is to come to informed decisions. So the start is a system or a structure, types of performance, and then we want to come to informed decisions or a ranking of decisions that can be taken. The framework also we need to be or enable, let's say, the, the identification or, or setting out different generic paths, different types of technologies, strategies that, that could be compared and, and evaluated. And then the framework, of course, also needed to be useful for the overall theoretical framework from working group one and should also allow working group three to identify the different points at which the methods and, and tools intervene. So this uh, categorization framework was described in a first fact sheet. Um, on SHM technologies and structural performance. Uh, 
Now for the second part of the work, uh, we've also started by looking at the current practice. So we've basically asked people um, in the working group to fill in a questionnaire uh, that allowed us to also identify the current practice in the treatment of uncertainties. And this work was, was recently finalized or brought to a next step in a summary fact sheet on the classification and treatment of uncertainty, so on which we'll, we'll tell a few words more. The dissemination is of course partly through the, the fact sheets. Uh, those from the first workshop are publicly available on the website. A number of others are available uh, to all people in the cost section and then of course also contributed to some of the sessions that were also listed by Sebastian. Now this framework has been presented a number of times so I'll, I'll uh, I'll be very brief on it and I'll, I'll just focus on those points that are also important in view of the discussion on uncertainty that is following up next. So basically what we've uh, realized is that if we're talking about performance, uh, the different types of performance are also determined by the different structural types. And as said, we've had contributions with dealing with different types, so not only bridges, but also other types. Um, this is the performance structural health monitoring or the experiments from the first presentation. They provide us with information. They allow us to make observations that link back to the indicators at the end with the aim of making informed decisions or, or ranking decisions. I'll give a few examples uh, next, but uh, let me focus on, on this link here between the observations and the indicators. Um, in what follows next, we'll make a distinction between direct links and indirect links in a sense that in some case uh, there is a straightforward link from the observations to the indicators. For example, if we consider data from accelerometers uh, that are deployed on a structure, uh, the vibrations that are picked up will help us to, or from those we can uh, extract model frequencies or mode shapes uh, with system identification algorithms, so that's uh, a more direct link. But of course the observations can also be used in an indirect way. If we think of the same vibrations and the same mode shapes and natural frequencies, those can also be used to update or to calibrate a model, uh, which would involve solving an inverse problem. So this would be an indirect link. And when I've already made reference to the uncertainties, the way in which the uncertainties are treated could also be, be somehow uh, different or perhaps different types of uncertainties will intervene. So two examples from the, the fact sheets that were um, collected within the frame of the working group. This one by uh, Marios Christantopoulos and his team on, on the Great Belt Bridge, a type where fatigue is of a concern. And, and what you can see here are two optional parts that could help on making uh, decisions on either live extension, uh, also including or taking into account possible actions such as strengthening. Uh, so fatigue can be monitored by keeping track of the stress ranges. Uh, stress ranges can be identified by measuring strains, and then this can be used uh, in this process. Alternatively, we can try to measure crack widths, uh, or the indicator is the crack width. We can try to measure those and then also come to decisions. Another example is the Z24 bridge that was also presented a, a couple of times uh, in the course of this action. Um, so the Z24 bridge was tested within the frame of a bright Durham, a European project, was monitored for one year. Uh, vibrations uh, were picked up and at the end of this year, uh, this information was used to set a baseline model that was used next to see if damage that was on purpose applied to the bridge could also be identified from changes in mode shapes and natural frequencies. So if such a monitoring system would be deployed on a real structure or on a, a structure that was actually in use because it was a real structure, uh, that would uh, help to let's say, to, to plan uh, inspections or repairs and, and at the end ensure the, the safety of the structure. Now when it comes to the uncertainty, this uh, life cycle assessment finds it based 
in the general framework of uh, structural liability. Uh, well, this distinction here comes from a publication uh, by, by Michael. Um, the reference is not here included in these slides, but you'll find all references in the two fact sheets that we have written. So, uh, in structural liability, a distinction is made between different types of uncertainties, physical, which could be considered as inherent, and then statistical and model uncertainties, which could be considered as epistemic or reducible uncertainty. So these will make the failure probability also uncertain, and of course this is also something which can evolve or which will evolve over time, as actually we'll also do the distinction between the different types of uncertainty. So that's the general framework, and what we've tried to do is, is see how structural health monitoring adds a layer of uncertainty on, on top of that. So I'll start here by discussing uncertainties that are involved in model calibration. So this is the indirect link between the observations and the indicators that I just referred to and then Michael will take over to discuss the uncertainties that pop up when, let's say, we have a more direct link between observations and indicators. So the idea here is that the, the information or the observations that we collect from a sensor network can help us to update a, a model of the system and, and so also the, the predictions that we make. Um, in the field, natural frequencies and mode shapes are often used for updating or calibrating models simply because they can be extracted from the structure while it's in operation. Uh, what we have as uh, excitation under ambient vibrations is sufficient for uh, identifying those, and then this uh, model calibration is usually done by solving a nonlinear least squares problem using uh, optimization methods. Now, what is important is that it's uh, an inverse problem and often imposed, which means that uncertainties will have a big effect on uh, this process. Yeah, that's the one we need. Now, of course, the, the framework uh, that we can applied to, to treat all these uncertainties in the model calibration process is the Bayesian framework that was already referred to in the, the first presentation. And it's important to, to know or, or to realize that many different types of uncertainties are involved. Uh, this is from a paper by Kennedy and O'Hagan that is cited a lot in the literature and, and they distinguish between parameter uncertainty, model inadequacy, residual variability, parametric variability, observation errors, code uncertainty. Now, distinguish, distinguishing between all of those is a challenge because uh, there is a limit to what you can identify from data. And taking them all, taking them all into account is also highly challenging. And, and what we see is that although this uh, general framework is available and everyone will acknowledge the importance of these uncertainties, in, in a lot of work, the focus is only on a few of these. and using a, a quite simplified representation of the uncertainty. And I think here is also the risk for bias that was uh, already referred to in the, the first presentation. So this is definitely uh, a challenge for us to continue working on in the future. I can be brief on these, the non-probabilistic methods, since we've already heard that the probabilistic methods were superior, but uh, when, when you're reviewing this work, you see that the probabilistic approach is, is, is not the only approach, especially when it comes to uh, epistemic uncertainty. Um, there are a lot of different alternatives uh, that are proposed with little or no consensus existing on, on, on the subject, and, and the preferred method often depends on the background of the person. Uh, everyone who's had a background in, in reliability engineering will, of course, advocate the use of the probabilistic methods. And also here in this context, uh, these methods, these probabilistic methods seem to be the most widely applicable as they uh, accommodate incorporating the different uncertainties that arise in the process. So with this, I'd like to hand over to Michael. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Gerd. Um, so statistical uncertainties appear in SHM uh, everywhere where we use data and calculate indicators uh, based on data. 
So um, there are three main sources of statistical uncertainties. I mean, any observations um, that are measured with SHN technology are just noisy uh, versions of the uh, physical quantities that we are getting. So if you're measuring accelerations, we don't exactly get our accelerations, but slightly perturbed versions of that uh, due to noise from the sensors. Um, the observations that we're measuring are only obtained in a finite time window. Um, while the exact computation of, uh, if you're talking about frequencies, for example, from uh, acceleration data, uh, they would inquire an infinite amount of time if we just have ambient excitation uh, to converge to the true uh, values. Um, and we have uh, insufficient information. Uh, so in some cases, uh, we could uh, get an exact computation of our indicators if we had just more information. Um, so, for example, if we knew exactly the, um, um, the forces acting on the structure, uh, then we could also um, compute exactly our frequencies uh, from the structure. But since we only have ambient excitation, we just can assume some um, statistical properties of our uh, unknown information of ins or insufficient information. And then, um, yeah, and then we have um, statistical uncertainty due to that. So, nearly all indicators that are computed from data are actually random variables. Uh, having some probability distribution and uh, all thus some statistical uncertainty. Mm, so the quantification and treatment of uh, this uncertainty is crucial for monitoring in general. Uh, I mean, we need to know um, if a change in an indicator uh, is just due to natural statistical variability or if there's actually a significant change um, in the structure, uh, thus indicating some abnormal behavior. Mm, so for uncertainty quantification, um, in the majority of cases, indicators are uh, just assumed to be Gaussian distributed, uh, which is our simplest uh, kind of distribution. Um, that can actually be justified often uh, through uh, the convergence properties of the indicators that we compute. So if we take time series, if we have some averaging uh, from s in statistics from the central limit theorem, we can actually show that indicators are Gaussian, or some of the indicators are actually Gaussian distributed. Um, and then in these cases, the covariance um, that we can uh, obtain contains all our uncertainty information, which would not be the case with more uh, complicated uh, distributions. Um, yeah, and then we can actually compute that covariance directly, for example, as a sample covariance if we have several instances of our indicators. Um, and if that's complicated to do, we can also use some kind of sensitivity-based propagation of the covariance from sample covariance that is directly linked to the data and then we can uh, propagate that then to the, um, to the computed indicators. Um, in other cases, indicators uh, may originate from pattern recognition or some more sophisticated statistical time series analysis, and uh, then we can derive the distributions uh, from those uh, methods then. Um, regarding uncertainty treatment, I um, mean the main point is obtain, uh, to obtain confidence intervals on our indicators which is very easy in the Gaussian case um, when we know the covariance, uh, the standard deviation, well, we know that in the three sigma interval, uh, we have a 99.7% probability to, be, to have the true value in that, uh, in that interval of the indicator. And uh, so if we have some scalar um, indicators, then we can directly use that to set up thresholds. Uh, for um, multivariate indicators, uh, we can use other tools like Malinobis distances, control charts to uh, treat the uncertainty that is involved in the indicators, uh, just to name a few. And uh, in a general setting, we can use hypothesis tests um, uh, where we can um, yeah, check for parametric changes in our system based on the underlying uh, distributions of the, uh, of the indicators and set up uh, then thresholds for decisions from there, um, getting confidence intervals uh, then based on, on the properties of such test statistics. So that was just uh, for, a, yeah, for the general framework. And in, during the um, activities of working group two then, um, uh, we launched a questionnaire uh, among the participants to assess the current practice in quantification and treatment uh, of the uncertainties. Um, um, and yeah, and the links between our measured quantities and the structural performance indicators. We asked the following questions. So we had uh, um, yeah, the context of the work on the uncertainties, uh, what sources um, of uncertainties are present in the work of the participants, how these uncertainties can be best described, um, how they are taken into account um, in the work, and which methods are used to, um, to quantify them and to propagate them. And um, yeah, to use these uncertainties then uh, for decisions. 
we received 18 responses from the participants um, that covered many different aspects um, in the proposed framework. Um, so the main context of the contributions that we got uh, are these, um, uh, yeah, all these five um, points. So uh, we have analysis of measurement uncertainties of the used technology. We have um, uncertainties in data-driven performance indicators that are mainly used for damage detection. Um, we have model-based performance indicators where uncertainties are due to unknown material characteristics, unknown model parameters. Uh, we have fatigue re or reliability analysis, uh, where then we have both model uncertainties and measurement uncertainties, and some contributions also in decision making. Yeah, and then just to give um, an overview of the contributions that we got. So um, these contributions are on measurement uncertainties, um, to analyze um, yeah, measurement uncertainties uh, in optical, uh, due to optical fibers, uh, or setting up a probabilistic model for measurement and inspection uncertainties uh, in general. Uncertainties in data-driven performance indicators are mainly linked to vibration-based SHM um, to um, yeah, know the uncertainties of uh, damage indicators. So here the um, uh, main sources of uncertainties are yeah, measurement uncertainties and ambient excitation. Um, we have a couple of contributions on model-based uh, performance indicators uh, where the uncertainties are due to unknown uh, material characteristics like uh, unknown soil properties, um, um, yeah, unknown um, environmental models. Uh, we have uh, FE model uncertainty um, that is involved. Um, then, and then for contributions in fatigue and reliability analysis, we have both um, model uncertainties and uh, database uncertainties that are involved. Um, yeah, and two contributions um, on decision making. So to sum up, um, the sources of uncertainties that are present in the works um, uh, that we got, where we got the feedback on, are mainly modeling uncertainties um, due to unknown material properties, imperfect models for changing environmental and operational conditions, uh, imperfect models for soil structure interaction, etc. Uh, we have measurement uncertainties, as mentioned previously, and we have uh, contributions on um, yeah, estimation and statistical uncertainties in, uh, in general. Um, the majority of the contributions that we got uh, describe those uncertainties then, um, through probabilistic models and statistical inference. So the description of indicators as uh, random variables and uh, random processes. And we just got, I think, one or two contributions that mentioned also fuzzy or interval-based methods or scenario-based uh, models. Um, mainly, um, the, the methods that were used by the participants to quantify or propagate uncertainties are uh, statistical methods and Bayesian inference, and um, uh, also structural uh, reliability methods then uh, for fatigue and reliability analysis. Um, uh, some contributions also um, used um, yeah, uncertainties cast and bounds by engineers, uh, which are not really based on, or not strictly based on probabilistic principles. So, and then I guess the most important question was, uh, are these uncertainties actually taken into account then in the, um, in the works or do they have an impact then on decision making actually? So, um, the presence of very different kinds of uncertainties is uh, really widely acknowledged. And we also had a few contributions on the resulting statistical uncertainty uh, of the indicators. Um, However, though uh, often or the uncertainties are at least partly quantified in the works, um, they are not always um, taken into account explicitly then um, yeah, in further analysis. So we know that there is some uncertainty, but it's not actually treated or taken into account for, uh, uh, for decisions in some cases. Overall, there is uh, probably a lack of consistency how uncertainties are are classified and also methods for um, the quantification and treatment uh, of the uncertainties is really um, on a case-specific basis. And somehow a holistic framework or holistic approach is, is, is currently missing to, um, yeah, to globally um, yeah, treat them and um, classify them. Uh, in general, we found also that the concept of confidence intervals um, should play a more prominent role um, for decisions. Um, given the varied sources of uncertainties that are present uh, everywhere in all parts of SHM, in all parts of the treatment of the information that we get. Um, 
So there is really a wide range of techniques that has been used, um, and the scope for categorization of them is really to improve um, consistency and transparency, also with respect to the, to the framework um, for structural performance uh, that was developed then in working group two. Um, to conclude, so um, as mentioned, a formal, holistic and consistent treatment of uncertainties uh, is, is required. We have um, uncertainties in all parts of SHM, in particular uh, regarding the observations from diverse SHM technologies, um, the propagation of uncertainties from the data um, to the actual performance indicators, directly or indirectly uh, with models, and taking into account model uncertainties, and then also uncertainties um, to take them into account for decisions, for actual decisions um, in life cycle management. The questionnaire that we have launched um, among the participants has shown that the importance of various types of uncertainties is uh, really widely recognized. Um, and yeah, but decision theory tools um, and decisions that we make should really include then also the uncertainty quantification and treatment um, to move towards uh, decisions with confidence levels. Um, in general, uh, Working Group 2 has evolved in accordance with the objective set in the Memorandum of Understanding. The, um, big, well the, yeah, the large feedback that we got from the participants um, uh, during the action revealed that well, the SM SHM applications in civil infrastructures are growing fast. We have different technology readiness levels in different sectors. Um, there are big efforts um, in the links between monitoring data and evaluating them then through structural performance indicators. Um, but the assessment of the SHM benefits beyond component level is still uh, also in its infancy, so a more global approach uh, yeah, should also be invested in. The developed frameworks um, in the working group can improve common understanding and achieve desired levels of transparency and consistency also with respect to the uncertainties that are involved in all parts of that, uh, of that framework. And uh, as we have seen, the treatment of uncertainties is still patchy and a more holistic uh, approach is required. So there's uh, probably quite some room for development also. Yep, then thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Gerd and Michael, for the overview of uh, working group two activities with a focus on uh, on uncertainties, especially on the uh, side of SHM. So this uh, provided clearly the basis for uh, one part of uh, of guidelines. We are uh, yeah just producing, um, and of course may, uh, some of your points may be uh, debatable, um, but I'm looking forward to that in the future. So, for the moment, a few questions. We have some time, Michael. Yeah, uh, thanks for uh, nice presentations. Uh, I, I should say it was uh, a very good uh, overview and uh, quite informative. Uh, I, I was a little bit uh, puzzled by the second last uh, slide where you mentioned that the uh, decision ranking should account for uh, or should be undertaken uh, with confidence levels. Uh, that I don't really understand what you mean. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit. Um, well, I guess the, um, the idea is that if we get some performance indicators, uh, they have some uncertainty. So if we go to some thresholds um, where we know that uh, with some confidence, everything is in, in order for our structure. Uh, we should take decisions and also based on this, uh, these confidence levels um, in order to see if, uh, yeah, with which probability things are actually in order or which are not, for example. Mm. <coughs> so yeah, well, uh, so f fundamentally, uh, Neumann and Morgenstern, uh, they told us that we should rank decision alternatives uh, in accordance with expected value of utility or benefit or whatever we call it. Uh, and that implies that uh, all, all uncertainties are uh, accounted for uh, 
uh, in the assessment of the expected value and that we don't, let's say, uh, um, simplify or uh, uh, somehow um, I don't know uh, how, how to express it, uh, but, uh, but develop uh, uncertainty representations which do not allow for a consistent evaluation of the expected value, like introduction of, um, of, of confidence intervals and, and uh, corresponding values, right? So um, my proposition would really be to uh, not uh, uh, account for uncertainties by introducing confidence uh, intervals in, uh, in any step of the process, but simply to include uh, all the uncertainties, of course, consistently, as you also have underlined many times, and then uh, based on that to, to do expected value operations. Yeah. And I guess yeah, if the uncertainties are already treated consistently during yeah, during the analysis um, for the expected utility, uh, yeah, then that's fine. And then at the end, um, the expected utility, um, yeah, or what we get at the end, um, since the uncertainties are included uh, already, uh, we already have some confidence level then that we get at the end on the expected utility as well, right? So that's uh, that's propagating then then through. And if we take decisions. Um, um, then those decisions are based already on those uncertainties uh, with respect to some thresholds um, that are involved. So there is also some but confidence if, levels. With but if, if, if there are uncertainties associated with the threshold, uh, just include those uncertainties in the general model. Yeah, and then, but yeah, if they are included, then we get, um, we get, um, yes, yeah, some, yeah, some confidence levels with which we take them. <laughs> Confidence yeah, levels, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> well, the decisions are clear. Okay, I, I think we will take this uh, in, in some of the discussions uh, and, and projects afterwards, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for this. Not on? Yes, no, it's on. Um, yes, uh, this was actually one uh, of the debatable points. Um, well, there may be something uh, something in it. Uh, to my view, I'm sorry, Mike. <laughs> but we, uh, on this level, I, I think we need to uh, be very aware of uh, what uh, Michael said, the foundations, which is the expected value of the utility and the axioms of, uh, of utility theory. Uh, we should be aware of, first point. Second, uh, I think it's good to uh, to discuss and also to work on on this basis. So in this sense, uh, I would like to uh, put this uh, in this context, uh, the, these debatable uh, comments here or statements. And uh, actually, uh, I'm looking forward to take this later in the project. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, okay, there's one more question. <laughs> okay, there's, uh, there's still, it's still the morning. I think uh, even Costas uh, raised the hand before. I'm sorry, Maria Fina. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, I wanted to make one point that probably you are actually you are very well aware that uh, once you use Bayes' uh, theorem. Uh, another issue is that you you introduce a complexity. Everything depends on how you will uh, build your likelihood. Uh, you assume a prediction error model. You could assume it uncorrelated, correlated, give any correlation structure that you want. You'll get completely different uncertainties, completely different uncertainties, posterior uncertainties. And this is, a, I think, a problem that uh, we have to really consider. I, I don't know if you have uh, any thoughts about that. I know Gerda knows very well about that. No, no, I, I fully acknowledge and also in the, uh, in the fact sheet we've added a little bit of more detail on indeed the, um, the, the model that is postulated for the prediction uncertainty. 
uh, and, and, and this is a key point because it's important to consider all possible sources of uncertainties and what you'll see in, 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 in the literature is that in many cases, also in our work, we are using a simplified representation that is not cover, covering everything. And we need to be uh, well aware of all the limitations therein if we introduce those in a decision-making framework. So I fully support the statement. Okay, one last question, Maria Pina. Yeah. It's a question that is a request of information. Um, in the papers that you collected, uh, is there already something about the probabilistic modeling of the indicators from uh, vibrations, uh, vibration-based indicators of damage? Um, for, for the probabilistic framework of vibration-based damage indicators? No, I mean... Uh, well, what you're asking is if Statistical models for the for the indicators have yes been. from indicate, yeah. uh, indicators from uh, dynamic yeah. vibration data yeah sure I mean there are there are there are works um, yeah that quantify the uncertainty from the indicators based on the properties of the data so we propagate the the uncertainty of the data basically to the indicators so a statistical model is uh, basically telling us then that uh, yeah we've got some probability distributions of these indicators that is Gaussian in most cases with a certain covariance and uh, well that's then our yeah the outcome of the direct um, propagation of the uncertainty uh, to the uh, to the indicators so there is some paper about yeah, this there is some paper okay. about this yeah thank you